All right. It's that goddamn time of year again, motherfuckers. It's Halloween, bros. Last year on the channel, we covered the 1979 sci-fi horror classic, Alien. Despite being one of the greatest movies of all time, the Oscars has this really, really insane gift for ignoring great films. As it stands, Alien was nominated for art direction and visual effects. While, okay, I'm happy the film at least got nominated for something, I'm actually not happy at all because the Oscars notoriously undermines the horror genre. While we can't confirm why this is the case, it's likely due to the fact that the horror genre is about fear. I'm not talking Spiders or Melissa McCarthy. I'm talking about the underlying fears Americans face about the country, the world, or just life in general. The best horror films are able to tackle some of the deepest and concerning subjects of their time. As an obvious example, the film Get Out is about the fear and anxiety black people encounter in modern America. All I know is sometimes, but if there's too many white people, I get nervous, you know? Needless to say, I think the Oscars tends to shy away from horror because the genre is usually so raw and visceral in its depictions of the world we exist in. It is for these reasons that as early as the 1970s, debatably one of the best decades for horror, the genre has already been shadow banned by critics and media analysts. America in the 1970s was undergoing a cultural shift caused by the ongoing war in Vietnam and other factors, which led many Americans to develop a sense of disillusionment with the country. Americans felt a disconnect between the violence happening in the war with the idealism presented by the American media. It was a confusing time for the nation. While we can look back and observe the brightest the era had to offer, we can also just as easily see the darkness right next to it. The 70s were a time that led many people to develop an intense and deep-seated fear, a fear that was felt by the young director Toby Hooper. Ultimately, this fear was then manifested into one of the most intense and unsettling films ever put on screen, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. During the time the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was being written, writers Toby Hooper and Kim Henkel were fixated on expressing their observations of what they deemed a failing America. They came at the right time as the horror genre had recently pivoted away from sci-fi movies of the 50s and 60s. In those movies, aliens and monsters were the threats. But in the 70s, horror was beginning to become defined by the threat of the people around you. George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead shook up the genre to depict an invasion of the American home, which was slowly becoming a literal and metaphorical fear of Americans after the Charles Manson case. After the success of this movie, Americans then became fixated on intense, low-budget horror films, like Last House on the Left. People were interested in these movies because whether they realized it or not, these films were closer to the overall sense of unease the country was experiencing compared to the big budget movies studios were putting out. So of course, once the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was greenlit, they were only given $140,000 for the budget. The average film budget at this time was $5 million. So this movie had to be made with less than a tenth of what the competitors have. It had to be cheap as fuck. No bullshit, they couldn't waste any time or money on this. While in many cases this would hurt a movie, in this rare instance, the low budget was actually a huge blessing in disguise. The film was unable to pay well-known actors, they were forced to use a cheap camera, and they couldn't afford to score the movie. On paper, this thing was going to be terrible, and truthfully kind of is, <laughs> but because the movie was falsely marketed as being based on a real event, this actually ended up helping the movie. The lack of familiar actors helped audiences suspend their disbelief. The cheap camera gave the film a documentary feel, and the lack of a score gave the film a more realistic feel to it. Upon release, 
the film was met with controversy worldwide. Everyone was being a freaking baby about it. The film was either forced to make cuts to avoid receiving an X rating, or it was outright banned. There was actually one instance in February 1976 where two theaters in Ottawa, Canada were advised by local police to not play the film or they would face morality charges. What the fuck does that mean? These police officers are fucking cringe, dude. From a critical lens, the film was either praised as an artistic masterpiece or critiqued for its graphic imagery. I mean, honestly, I think if you have a problem with the movie, you just need to grow the fuck up. What goddamn horror movie do you know that has no graphic imagery? Answer the question, bro. If you if you talk like this, you're still in diapers, real talk. You need to you need to grow up, dude. Shut the fuck up, bitch. <sighs> hey guys, um, it's Bullmaster here. Just wanted to come on the mic and apologize for some of the comments I've made in this video. I've made a serious and continuous lapse in my judgment, and I don't expect to be forgiven. Um, I'm simply here to apologize, so sorry. I keep this close to being the plot of the film is as simple as some of you fuckers. Okay, all right. I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't know what's gotten into me today. I gotta calm down. Hey guys, um, I fucked up again, and I'm sorry. Um, I'm just gonna delete the channel. Basically, five friends go on a road trip to visit an old family homestead in, you guessed it, Texas. While on the trip, things quickly take a turn for the worst after encountering a bizarre hitchhiker and running out of fuel. Then they find themselves at the front door of a farmhouse filled with an insane and cannibalistic family. There's a cook, a deranged hitchhiker, and the star of the show, Leatherface. Events then turn for the worse as the friend group tries to escape from this madness. And really, that's the plot. There's nothing to it. The dialogue is straightforward, and the characters are overall pretty two-dimensional. While this usually would be a sign of a bad movie or show, like say for instance Euphoria. Yeah, I don't give a fuck about Euphoria, suck my nuts. Why this works in this particular movie is that you have five friends who just seem like an ordinary group of people. Their writing and performances are completely natural, which really drives home the true story angle of this movie. This is also great in the movie because it heightens the rawness of the film. We don't know anyone. We don't know why this family is crazy, how they got there, or what motivates them. They just exist. Just like the characters are suddenly introduced to this insane part of the world, so are we as the audience. While the film is accessible to anyone, the film is also incredibly layered for those who are willing to dig into its themes and how Toby Hooper's directing makes those themes apparent from a visual standpoint. As mentioned earlier, America was beginning to change. When we reflect on the 1960s America, we often imagine the peaceful generation. You know, the hippies. Are you a part of the love generation? Yes. What's different about the love generation? Oh, I don't know. The whole world just seems to be happy. I mean, every, when everybody's in love, it just everybody seems to be so happy here. Do you love me? Yes, I love everybody. Is it possible to love everybody? Yes. In general, Americans were more trusting and friendly. It was extremely common for people to pick up hitchhikers and take them wherever they were going. Back then, you didn't think twice about it. Today, we recognize the danger that comes when trusting strangers. While they may not hurt you, we need to conduct ourselves as though they would. I don't know who you are. I don't even know who I'm talking to. After Watergate, Vietnam, and the Manson family, Americans were beginning to lose their sense of innocence. In the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Toby captures this change brilliantly. Right at the start of the film, the characters pick up a hitchhiker, which, remember, would have been a completely normal thing to do around this time. The film lets us know immediately that the naivete and purity of the 60s were officially over. They take the head and they 
boil, except for the tongue. And they scrape all the flesh away from the bone. They, they, they use everything. They don't throw nothing away. This guy is a complete fucking maniac. His presence gives the characters and the audience a sense of fear. Toby plays on the fact that the audience might be expecting a friendly encounter by picking up this hitchhiker, so he intentionally does the opposite. What we expect from the real world doesn't apply to this film. Something is wrong. This kind of bait and switch happens numerous times over the course of the movie. The shopkeeper who seems kind and understanding? Yeah, he cooks and eats humans, bro. This perfect white house with a gorgeous summer sky behind it? There's a lunatic with a chainsaw inside. The film therefore juxtaposes what we expect versus what is. The writing is able to emphasize the growing fear of the people around us and the idea that our civilization is not what we thought it was. Toby is then able to use his directing capabilities to complement and accentuate the themes present in the writing. He implements several film techniques to emphasize this contrast throughout the course of the movie. Specifically, his strategic use of color. Color in film can be used in a variety of ways. For instance, some of you may be familiar with how the show Breaking Bad color codes each of its characters. You think Marie, you think purple, you think Walt, you think green, so on and so forth. In Breaking Bad, color functions as a tool to emphasize the mood of a scene or a character. In the scene where Walt proclaims he is the danger, many have pointed out how intense this red shirt is especially compared to his generally green wardrobe. I am not the danger, Skyler. I am in danger. A guy opens his door and gets shot and you think that of me? Goddamn right. Let's look at another example, this time from the show Death Note. To fill you in quickly, at this point in the story, we have two characters that are right in the middle of a psychological war. Both parties are firmly against the other and are trying to catch the other. This character is about to reveal his true identity to this character to bait a reaction out of him. Let's pay attention to the color as the scene unfolds. The director of this show introduces a deep red and blue as soon as the character reveals himself. They're using it to call attention to the opposition between these two characters. Notice how the character being confronted is red, which can imply danger or an alarm. This character is blue, he's the one in control and he knows he's got the other character on edge. We then hear this character's inner voice, which makes the dramatic tension of the scene increase. There's contrast between the role he is trying to play versus who the character really is. It's a simple but effective way to utilize color, and this director makes sure to introduce color as soon as this scene calls for it. These deep and saturated colors are used sparingly throughout the show, usually during an intense or dramatic scene. Let's now return to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and see how this film utilizes color. In this film, Color is used to contrast the spirit of the youth with the brutality of the cannibal family. Let's take a look at this shot here. Immediately, you should be noticing how vibrant and saturated these colors are. The shorts, the sky, the trees, everything is colorful and lively. This is the kind of shot that you could imagine would be printed on puzzles. Now let's observe a shot including the cannibalistic family. Clearly, it's ugly. <laughs> This shot lacks the kind of vibrance of the shot we just saw. There's obviously color, we have some yellows and mud colors here, but it doesn't pop out at you in the same way. It's dull, lifeless, depressing. It's like Melissa McCarthy. <laughs> this is what happens when you corner a rat. You corner me, I will fucking chew through you. I'll chew through you. Catherine, you're better than this. <laughs> Fuck you, Jill. Let's look at them side by side. Clearly, you can see the contrast Toby is establishing between our protagonist and our antagonist. This works in complete harmony with the themes we explained in the plot. The film is trying to communicate that despite the world being seemingly beautiful and kind, it's also ugly and cruel. 
ultimately, it's emblematic of the awkward period of time the film came out in. These ideas are further expressed by Toby Hooper with his use of I breathe in stereo, the stereo sounds strange. I know that if you hide, it doesn't go away. Throughout the course of the film, Hooper also establishes this contrast with tone. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the term, it basically just means how bright an image is. All pictures or frames fit somewhere on the spectrum between being light or dark, or they can be light and dark at the same time. Sometimes they can be mostly dark with little light, and sometimes they can be mostly light with little dark. There's an infinite number of ways tone can be used in art. Whether you're aware of it or not, tone is a part of every shot you've ever seen. Here's the opening shot to one of Ariel Pink's music videos. Now, look, it doesn't take a genius to observe that this shot is very clearly very bright. We would say this is a light toned shot. Now let's observe a shot from the movie Hereditary. As you can see, this shot is very dark. There's very little light. So we then conclude this shot has a dark tone overall. Some of you might be asking, well, what if a shot is dark and light? Like this shot, for instance. Well, we would just say there's a contrast of tone within the shot. Tone serves a unique purpose depending on the movie you're watching. Generally speaking, and I do mean generally, lighter tones express a sense of security, safety, and ease, while darker tones imply danger, instability, and confusion. This is why 90% of horror films you see take place during the night. Again, these are general rules of thumb that great artists are prone to breaking. Ari Aster's Midsummer, for instance, is a horror film that is composed with primarily high tone shots. This is extremely creative and flips the entire genre on its head. In Texas Chainsaw Massacre, tone tends to be used more traditionally, but Toby is able to pull off an incredibly cool and creative tonal shift throughout the movie. The movie starts during the day and features primarily light tone shots. This works, as in these light tone shots, there's no danger. As the film progresses, the tone gradually becomes darker as the sun sets. By the time we get to the end, the film is practically pitch black. While this seems pretty straightforward, check this out, check this out. The beginning of the movie features light tone shots and the end, dark tone shots. One might suspect there's a point where the tone goes immediately from light to dark, but that's not the case. The movie starts with light tone shots in the beginning of the film, then contrasting shots in the middle, then finally we land on dark tone shots at the end. Here's a still from each third of the movie. As you can see, light tone, contrasting tones, dark tones. The contrasting tones become prominent as soon as the characters are in close proximity to Leatherface's house. Let's observe this shot, which occurs right before the characters start being picked off. The inside of the house is completely dark, while the outside is bright. He is expressing that there is danger in the house and safety outside. The same outside that is colorful and full of light is now being contrasted with the dark and colorless inside. It makes the flow of the movie completely seamless. Ultimately, tone is being used to deepen and affirm the movie's central themes. The movie employs these light and dark tones as a way to punctuate the contrast between the innocent and the dangerous. It serves as a reminder that no matter how good things may look from the outside, the world will always be riddled with problems beyond our comprehension. While we may try to avoid our problems with blissful ignorance, if this film communicates one thing above anything else, it is that at some point we will all have to come face to face with fears we didn't even know existed. Conclusions Look, I gotta be honest, it's 2 in the morning and I'm tired. This movie is fucking genius, okay? It's genius. And it's 83 minutes, it accomplishes more than what some movies do in 3 hours. I mean, I'm talking to you, Irishman, what the shit is that about? You ever noticed how weird it is that every movie has to be 3 hours? Why? Just make something short and sweet, then long and boring. It's so annoying. The horror genre has actually recently become a little more sophisticated in its approach to storytelling. Gone are the days of Halloween and Friday the 13th, and now we're getting films like Hereditary and Get Out which offer the same level of stories and visuals as a drama would. While I think these films are fantastic in their own right, 
I think it's worth noting that you don't necessarily need interesting characters or complexity to deliver a rich horror film. Sometimes, shit just works because it's simple. Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a movie you could watch with no audio and still get a lot out of. No joke, this thing just works as a film. It's genuinely one of the few movies that I can genuinely say scare me. <laughs> you wanna know why? You wanna know why? This movie doesn't f care. It does not care. It doesn't care about whether you're comfortable. It doesn't care to be scary when it doesn't need to be by using cheap scares. It doesn't explain a goddamn thing to you. It just happens. It's also a fantastic marker to the era from which it came. We've now explored how the film is able to capture the transition between the innocence and spirit of the 60s with the gloom and pessimism that started to sprinkle in during the 1970s. The film does this with its contrasting characters, colors, tones, and more. We didn't even get to the cover of the goddamn camera, or the editing, or the sound. It's a film that perfectly captures the duality of human nature in a world that is often confusing and overwhelming. Life is full of color and light, but it is also full of darkness and sadness. Because after all, the most beautiful thoughts are always besides the darkest. i